Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our second workshop of community ecology. And as on the other days, we're having excellent talks with influential researchers from different areas of ecology. For instance, to the opening talk this morning, um, we have Professor Jonathan Chase. He's a professor at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, aka IDIV, where he's the head of the Biodiversity Synthesis Research Group, which is aimed towards developing a cohesive framework for understanding the patterns of biodiversity and its heterogeneous distribution across multiple scales, as well as the underlying ecological drivers that influence those patterns. He obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago. I only have a couple more words to the participants. For those in Zoom, um, you can use the Q&A box uh, below and the host, the, the host will ask them after Professor Chase is done with his talk. For the people on YouTube, thanks for your participation as well. You can also ask questions and depending on the volume of the questions received on Zoom, it's possible to pick up a couple questions from YouTube. Thanks again for your participation. Professor Chase, thank you for accepting our invitation to the workshop. Um, I wish this was a presential event so you and Professor Labelt could sign uh, my book, but it's a great honor to have you here online and listen to your talk about scale as a unifying tool for synthesis in community ecology and feel free to start whenever you are ready and let me know if you need anything. Okay, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Great, it was seemed to be muted for a moment. Apologies for um, the little glitch. Uh, it really is an honor to be part of this uh, group of people, this amazing group of people. And I suspect you'll see a lot of overlap in some of the talks that um, you've participated in and seen over the week and, and into the week. Many of us have worked together, we've certainly influenced each other, but I hope that I give you some novel perspective on my, my view of community ecology and biodiversity within community ecology specifically. Uh, and I know the main audience, a lot of you are graduate students, PhD students or masters. And I wanna go back 20 years or so to when I was just finishing up my PhD uh, with Matthew Leibold as my advisor, who you saw the other day. And about the time I was finishing up my PhD, you all know you get dirty, you get wet, you get muddy, you do the work that you're trying to do to discover something about species interactions and coexistence and so forth. And at the time, there was a, a wonderful series of papers that were published in Oikos one of which was by John Lawton, who was an icon in the field and certainly a hero of mine, and, and created a lot of angst uh, amongst young people. And you'll probably see other people talk about this paper where he mentioned that community ecology actually has the worst of all worlds. It's not big and bold enough to break out of complexity. And we don't have sort of this this broader perspective that we're hoping for. And so he suggested it was time to move on. We all know community ecology is, is plagued with the idea of the answer is it depends. And many people don't find that very satisfactory. But the good news is I think since 1999, we've made a huge amount of progress in community ecology to get past the it depends and to think about generality in a slightly different way than maybe we often had imagined generality would emerge. It's not always competition is important or top down versus bottom up or niche versus neutral. There's ways to integrate these ideas towards generality. And there are two perspectives. One, I think you heard probably a little bit about from Pablo Marquette and others is more the sort of macroecological perspective or the development of universal theories. These can be based on mathematics or energetics, down to physics and so forth. Uh, 
or there can be synthesis of data sets. And the, the NCs in the US, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Professor Chase, excuse me. Yes. Uh, sorry, um, you're not sharing your screen, so we are not seeing your presentation. Okay, it was shared, but now my apologies. Um, so it was being shared and in the Zoom. It's a green button here, share screen at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I do it all the time. There we go, okay. I am sorry. No. Sorry. Try that again. Sorry for interrupting you. That's what, no, I'm glad you did. I'm sitting here presenting slides that you can't see. So Thank now, you. and then if I, can you still see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So it started with the idea, this quote from John Lawton, and then really thinking about how we create ideas to get towards generality, with one perspective being this macroecological perspective, often based on first principles, and another perspective being looking more at, um, sorry, does anybody know how I hide this stuff? Is that, can you, is it all in your way too? Okay. Um, the other perspective being, amassing lots of data to start thinking about why, how we can achieve these generalities. And it could be in productivity diversity relationships or disturbance relationships. It could be in uh, top down versus bottom up relationships or in building maps to look at patterns of diversity locally or globally. And it's this kind of synthesis that I'm gonna spend my time talking about today. But I wanna go back a, a moment to ask what is synthesis? A lot of us, especially nowadays, think about synthesis as something where we take a bunch of heterogeneous kinds of data. We might take trait data or abundance data and maps and environmental data, and we take data on species distributions and their traits. And we throw it all together through a bunch of beautiful code that smart people have built, hierarchical analyses and so forth, and create what I call a synthesis smoothie. Now, this is a, a little bit of a simplified version, but I think a lot of us are doing these kinds of analyses and assuming that with lots and lots of data and lots of lots of useful analyses, we can create inference. And what I wanna tell you today is that I think we're still a little bit in denial that the world is a little bit more complex than we care to think about when we build these models. And I wanna step back to think about what synthesis really is from a philosophical perspective. These are a couple of German philosophers from the 1800s where they talked about synthesis as taking an idea and taking an antithesis, the idea being the thesis, and the opposite being the antithesis, and creating some th synthesis between those ideas by taking observations and counter observations and trying to come up with generality by creating a synthesis. Of course, this is an iterative process that continues on and on. And the point that I wanna make is that no matter what we want to admit, we're all biased. We're biased in how we think the world works. And we have to do our best to minimize those biases and to accept that they exist, but that we need to think in a little bit of a broader context in order to minimize and think about how we can achieve a synthesis, that there's lots of different perspectives on how biodiversity is structured, how coexistence works. And in order to find synthesis, or generality, we need to recognize those biases. This was a book published in the 80s by Levins and Lewinton. Of course, it also has some political connotations that I don't wanna get into, simply to focus on the idea of achieving synthesis. And again, this has been a huge problem or, or, or 
working towards a solution for the last several decades. In fact, right there in, in Brazil, there's a new ideas for centers there. Um, based on the model of NCs, we have a similar model here in Germany called ESTIV, where we bring groups of people together, hopefully with lots of data, hopefully with different perspectives, different ideas, sometimes even polar opposite ideas to come up with a synthesis. And I've had the honor of being part of this ESTIV and multiple NCs groups to really start doing that. And I wanna to talk to you about these perspectives when we start breaking down our biases. And so I'll give you a number of vignettes or ideas about how I've worked on these problems. And I'll start with one that comes from headlines that you see all the time, at least in the English speaking world, but I think all over the world, there's a lot of research emerging about the problem of insects. And I start with the idea that insects are fine. In conservation biology, we usually talk about other groups of organisms, birds or mammals or other kinds of vertebrates that are really the ones at risk. And we've always sort of had this gut feeling that insects are not really a problem. We know about plagues of locusts or armies of caterpillars or you know, mayflies emerging at night, just covering the, um, you know, the, the infrastructure. And so the idea that even after a nuclear war, it's gonna be the cockroaches that make it through this has, has made us recognize that, you know, insects are pretty robust. And the reason I bring this up is because over the past few years, there have been a, a number of, news stories that have talked about this idea of the insect Armageddon. You see crazy apocalyptic stories coming out in very popular magazines here in Germany with our president Angela Merkel with a moth over her mouth, um, sort of recognizing this problem that insects are having that we're observing. And, and the recent emergence of this idea comes from a paper that was published three years ago from here in Germany. And in that paper, it sort of it was it was published in PLOS One, but got a huge amount of press because of this 75% decline over about 30 years in flying insect biomass. And it just it rolled from there that we have this insect apocalypse going on. It's phenomenal to me that in three years this paper has been cited almost two, 1,200 times. Of course, this isn't the first time we've talked about insect declines paper in Science a decade earlier, recognized declines in Britain or in the Netherlands. We've seen declines in other groups of organisms, of other groups of insects and other locations. And so people are starting to jump on this bandwagon of insect declines. And here's a paper that was published a year ago or so from Puerto Rico. So we have an example from a tropical system. Um, Interestingly, the PIs of the site where these data were collected were quite critical of this story. Another global review uh, was published that has been cited again, just last year, it's been cited over 600 times. But again, people are jumping on this saying, hey, wait a minute, this, this bandwagon of this insect Armageddon is maybe going a little too fast and we have to step back a little bit. And it's amazing, week after week, month after month, new papers are being published on these, the issue of insect declines in top journals like Nature, where you see this uh, declines uh, over a 10 year period in, in Germany and these biodiversity exploratories, declines in Britain and a number of groups. But then you get the opposite effect where some people are saying, hey, wait a minute, actually we're seeing increases over some time periods and different groups seem to be showing different results. In fact, just in the past couple of weeks, papers have been published. Um, Mike Kaspari and colleagues have published a paper showing grasshoppers declining at a field site, a long-term ecological research site in the United States. Whereas another paper published in Nature Ecology and Evolution just a couple of weeks ago, finds no changes in insect abundances across the same sites. It's amazing to me, there's already papers in process criticizing the results of these analyses because everybody has their ideas, their biases, their view of what's happening. 
And so we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and really just ask, what do we know? And so Rural Van Klink, a postdoc at SDIV, was able, at the, after the publication of that 2017 paper from Germany, said, hey, wait a minute, this is getting out of hand. Let's see if we can evaluate the evidence. And he put together a team of folks with different skills, um, different abilities to contact people for data and started building a database of just, what do we know? What do we know about insect populations? In this case, he put data sets together in the end from 100, almost 160 studies from 1500 sites with the criteria that these sites have to have 10 years of data or more. These are some of the sites. These are all of the sites you can see. Yeah, there's a lot, but you can see one of the things you'll notice, especially in Brazil, there are holes. You'll see this time and time again in these kinds of analyses that we do. We call these global analyses, but they're really what's available analyses when we do these syntheses. So we were able to come up with some patterns, some interesting patterns from what we know. I wanna caution you to remember that these aren't global patterns. These are patterns of what data exist. And we found that in fact, it seems actually to my surprise that terrestrial insects do seem to be declining, but aquatic insects actually from these data sets seem to be increasing. We found some geographical variation. It seems like North America and Europe are North Americans, especially is driving a lot of these patterns. Of course, we found very little in tropical areas because of data limitations. You can dig in deeper. Germany does seem to have something different going on than say the United Kingdom where, or some other parts of the world. The, the West and the US and the Midwest also seem to be showing some strong declines. And so we thought this was a fun analysis and useful to synthesize what's known. But a lot of people have criticized and jumped on the idea that we still don't actually know what the global pattern is. And absolutely, we don't know that from these kinds of data. We can do the best we can with, with calculations, but, but there's huge geographic bias. There's bias in what data exists, where they come from. There's also a huge problem that I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk talking about, which is what is your response variable? What are we measuring? When we say insect Armageddon, some people have something in their head, like butterflies. Others have other things in their head, like species diversity or biomass or how many bugs are on the, hit the windscreen of my car as I drive down the road. Everybody has a different idea about what insect Armageddon means. And so when we do our analyses and we look at our response variables, we're often looking at very different kinds of things. And so we don't even know how to start building a synthetic model to take all of these different kinds of variables into account. And so in the rest of my talk, I wanna focus more specifically on not abundances, which is what our data from the insects we're on, just the sheer number of bugs. But a lot of people wanna know about species richness or diversity or species composition. And so when we start trying to do synthesis on these kinds of questions, the world gets a lot more complicated. And the reason it gets more complicated is because sample matters a lot. If I sample a small area, I get a certain number of species. And if I sample a larger area, I get more species. We call this a species area curve or a rarefaction curve or accumulation curve or any, any other number of things. From that, we can also calculate things like distance decay relationships. We can calculate rank abundance relationships. But each one of these things that we measure depends on how I look at the world. Am I looking at the world from a one meter quadrat, from a 50 hectare plot, from a one degree grid sale? that really influences the answer that I get because diversity doesn't scale linearly with area. And this turns out to be a huge, huge problem for synthesizing biodiversity because what we're doing in English, we use the concept of comparing apples to oranges. When I'm comparing diversity in a small plot, it's not the same thing as comparing diversity in a larger plot because it's aggregating across a different scale. 
And so anytime I compare one plot to another plot, these two plots differ in some particular parameters that I can manipulate, you can see that these curves change. And so if I measure at this scale, I get one answer of the difference between these two curves. I get a different answer if I measure at this scale, or I can even get a flip-flop and get a pineapple out at the larger scale. I'm not comparing the same thing when I'm comparing biodiversity. So when I throw those all into a smoothie and try to say something about biodiversity and how it changes, you can imagine how complicated this can get. And the way we usually do this is that our, statistic, our statistical friends have given us tools called covariates or various bits of the hierarchy where we can add these in and take care of the problem. And I'll show you why that isn't actually as straightforward as we like to think. Now scale, when we mention the word scale has a huge number of ideas. The scale can be in the system. Are you a terrestrial or a marine ecologist? It could be taxonomic. Are you talking about one family of frogs or all of amphibians? I'm gonna focus mostly on spatial scale, but it can also be temporal scale. Many of the ideas that I'm talking about are relevant to all of these kinds of perspectives. And I'll give you two vignettes in the, in the remainder of my talk that show you why scale is so important for synthesis and hopefully start getting towards some ways to solve this problem. One is on community assembly, the niche versus neutral theory, and the other is related to some of the other talks you've seen by Maria Dornalis and um, Anne McGurin will be talking about this and Mark Velland uh, looking at biodiversity change. The idea of beta diversity is critical for both of these concepts. And so thinking about beta diversity as a way to think about scale becomes a critical part. And so starting out with the thesis again, the thesis here for community assembly for many years was that niches were quite important for how species coexisted, interacted, competed with one another, and influence biodiversity. And these are just two examples from two of the sort of fathers of this field, Evelyn Hutchinson. And I like this example from these, these aquatic water boatmen that lived in um, a pond in Italy. The homage to Santa Rosalia was based on the size differences of these insects. Or Robert MacArthur and his warblers, and the warblers were foraging in different parts of the trees, allowing them to coexist because of the niche differentiation. And this idea, this idea of niche, played a huge influence on the field for many decades. And so these are just some percentages of papers in the journal Ecology that use the word niche. And you can see it just from its invention from Joseph Grinnell and, and Charles Elton, it grew and grew until about the 80s when it really crashed. And I suggest part of the reason it crashed was we had an antithesis, an alternative perspective that Dan Simberloff and Don Strong and many others marched ahead and said this niche idea is premature. It doesn't necessarily underlie a lot of the patterns that we see. Interestingly, niche is coming back. Uh, part of the reason it's coming back is uh, I, I like to think because of a book that Matthew Leibold and I published in the early 2000s, um, but also because of a book that Stephen Hubble published at around the same time on neutral theory, which was very much an antithesis to the niche theory. And so we have these ideas and we start out thinking about this niche versus neutral theory as a very strong dichotomy. And when these ideas especially when the neutral theory was first published, we had people saying, oh my God, what is going on here? How can we reconcile these two ideas? Well, let's test them. And so you had a bunch of tests that were about niche versus neutral theory. And a bunch of tests were fav favorable towards niche and a few were favorable towards neutral. And then people started to realize that that was maybe a bit silly to think about these as a dichotomy so very soon thereafter, we started recognizing a gradient or a continuum of, of this idea. And we've now have, after 
15 to 20 years of this, a new bit of, of synthesis. Mark Vellin published a lovely book in 2016 called The Theory of Ecological Communities, where he took ideas of the neutral theory, ideas of niche theory, ideas of evolution, and put them together. Matthew Leibold and I wrote sort of a, a bit of a follow-up to our niche book, achieving somewhat similar concepts, recognizing the roles of dispersal, the roles of environment, the roles of species traits, the roles of stochasticity or randomness. And so how do we deal with this? Well, a lot of the tests that came out were things like comparing distance decay relationships or beta diversity. This is one of the early tests of niche versus neutral theory. Richard Condit and Hubble and a number of colleagues looked at distance decay relationships from the Barrow, Colorado Island forest plot and then moving out into several other countries in Central America, finding patterns that they suggested were consistent with the idea of the neutral theory. About the same time these things were coming up, I was again in doing my PhD, sort of freaking out a little bit about John Lawton saying community ecology has no general laws. The general laws that I was uh, familiar with were that these ponds that I was spending my time in really seemed that niche was driving what was going on. You have ponds that are dry every once in a while, ponds that are in the forest, ponds that are wide open and have giant fish swimming around in them. And in each of those ponds, I can tell you exactly which species we would expect based on its habitat. Which frogs would live in which ponds? Which dragonflies would live in which ponds? Which snails, which beetles? I could tell you with very good certainty which species would live in these ponds. So clearly niche plays a huge role to me. And it's hard for me to understand why these tropical forest people are finding a different answer. And so if I do the same kinds of analyses that Condit did, I find no distance decay in these ponds, but I find a huge effect of environmental decay. Environment plays a huge role. And um, I had the opportunity to tune into some talks earlier this week, and I know there have been some discussions of this idea of variation partitioning. This is just one way to visualize variation partitioning. I don't wanna get into the details. I just wanna look at the cloud of points. This is the importance of environment, the partition of environment. This is the importance of spatial patterns and these are the random residuals. There's a few points to take from here. There's a lot of clouds. This is, these are the data from Carl Coteney. He put a number of meta-analysis meta together of a number of these meta-communities. And you can see that they all vary. Some of them show stronger niche, some of them show stronger environment. And what is amazing to me is that you can see the BCI, the Barrow Colorado Island forest plot where Hubble spent most, most of his career, shows no niche. Whereas my ponds with Matthew Leibold show a ton of niche. So here we are at these extremes, writing our worldviews and our books about these extremes in a much more dynamic perspective. So here we are, desperate for synthesis in this cloud of points. Unfortunately, there's a bigger problem. It's, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, maybe tropical forests are just different. Maybe, you know, the evolutionary processes, the huge species pools, the environmental constancy and so forth means they're just different. It might be, but we don't know that yet. And the reason we don't know that yet is we're still comparing apples to oranges. Imagine the organisms that I'm looking at in my ponds, these little snails, these zooplankton, these tiny little dragonflies, tiny compared to the meta community that I'm studying, right? Compare that to the BCI forest plot. Hubble and the BCI forest plot, they're counting about 250,000 individuals in that forest plot. I've got orders of magnitude more individuals in my meta community. In fact, if I were to compare my ponds to Hubble's forest plot, I would have to study the dynamics in a single pond and what's going on on this side of the pond and what's going on in this side of the pond. And I bet you I'd find a whole lot more randomness when I did that, okay? Or if Hubble wanted to scale up to the size of the meta community that I'm looking at, he'd have to go, to the scale of the entire BCI island. In fact, that's exactly what Garzan Lopez 
and colleagues showed a few years ago is that when you look at the 50 hectare forest plot on BCI, you often don't find environment by species associations. Turns out that BCI plot was purposefully put in a pretty flat homogeneous area. Now, anybody who studies that plot argues, no, there's lots of variation. Yes, but not relative to the entire island. And we start seeing habitat associations when we scale out, when we zoom out. And so when we're comparing apples to apples, we can get a very different answer. So a postdoc here at Estiv wanted to explore this in a little bit more depth. And so what he did was he put a little simulation model together and showed that just by varying the window, how we look at the world, do I look at the world like a 50 hectare forest plot with 250,000 individuals? Or do I look at the world with half a million or a million or 10 million individuals? In the, very, the environmental variation that they're observing, they're seeing, the, very, the partitioning of that variance fundamentally shifts as I increase sampling extent in these ponds, so much so that if I go back to this cloud of points from, these are from 50 or 60 different natural meta communities, if I look at this cloud of points and I do one simulation run, all the same parameters, the same niche, the same neutral, and all I'm doing is changing the window of observation. Duarte could find a huge variation, the variation in a cloud from one simulation that spanned the entire range that we found from all of these meta communities. And so the point is that we don't know yet if tropical systems are fundamentally different in how they assemble and the, 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 the generality and the way that meta communities assemble, the importance of dispersal, the importance of stochasticity, because we haven't measured them right. We haven't corrected for this scaling problem. So to wrap up this vignette, yes, there's a continuum, niche and neutral processes are both going on, no question. Probably more so in some kinds of systems than others, but we need the ability to correct for the scale problem in order to understand how those, those, um, those parameters matter. We don't yet have that for most of these data sets. We need to compare apples to apples. To do that, we need to control the numbers of individuals or the sampling as sent, or maybe we need to do some allometric controls. We need to be more creative about this. So the second vignette, that I wanna talk about is the influence of spatial scale on this idea of biodiversity change. This is where my talk uh, is uh, related somewhat to what Maria Dornales talked about and um, what some others are gonna be talking about, but I'll, I'll try to leave some of, some of her work aside and talk a little bit more about some of the other ways that we can control for this scale issue. Now, the reason we are worried about this is because clearly, there's an influence of humans on biodiversity. We usually say humans are causing biodiversity loss. And we usually say this is the, you know, six maths extinction ongoing. And oh my God, we really have to do something about this. No question, we do. We see this as we start also looking at average effect sizes. This is, these are meta-analyses of different kinds of anthropogenic effects, habitat loss, or invasive species. And you can see these generally negative declines in average species richness in these local plots, as well as extinctions at the global scale. But why are we worried about this? Well, because our friend Mark Velland and Maria Darnales published papers about four or five years ago that really threw a wrench in this, in this problem. We had this idea that biodiversity is declining. But actually, if you look a little bit more closely, especially if you're looking at local scales, it's not usually the case. In fact, biodiversity can increase, it can decrease, and on average seems to stay the same. I don't wanna get into the debates about exactly who said what and you know, where the changes are happening and where they're not. There's a lot of variation. So when you have people doing analyses like this, this analysis has been published, a few, a few years ago in nature using the PREDICTS database, which is sort of a space for time substitution to look at impacts of 
human anthropogenic effects on biodiversity, you see a lot of red. And so these are projections up to 32% loss of species richness at the local scale. And what I wanna challenge you is to define what 32% means, right? Because at the local scale means something very different in these different studies and these different experiments. Is it a meter squared? Is it a kilometer? Is it a grid cell? It turns out to matter a lot. For example, right here in my backyard in a town called Hala, which is about 20 uh, kilometers from here or so, colleagues of mine showed in Germany, biodiversity has actually increased over the last 400 years. There are more species today in Hala than there were 400 years ago. So how do you reconcile these bright red biodiversity declines with the fact that there's more species today in Hala? Clearly scale matters. I have a whole talk about this. I'm only gonna spend a moment on it. The scale dependence of biodiversity change is critical. This is one analysis, sort of a meta-analysis that we did of these kinds of drivers, disturbance, environmental change, land use. And these are data where I, people measured biodiversity where I could get information from more than one scale. Might be a replicate of a, a treatment and then the whole treatment. So I could take the average and the total. And what you can see here is the effect size at the small scale and the effect size at the large scale. And if there were no scale dependence, it would be a one-to-one -one relationship. So there's a lot of things to take from here. One is there's some places that flip-flop. That means that a driver can have a negative effect at a local scale, but a positive effect at a regional scale, much like we saw in that Hala example. But even if you know lots of them are sort of falling in these appropriate boxes, there's a huge amount of variation. Here's a study that had a huge effect at the large scale, but almost no effect at the small scale, and vice versa, a big effect at the small scale, but almost no effect at the large scale. And on average, we find that small scale effects, when I measure numbers of species richness change in plots, meter squared or so forth, I'm overestimating the effect on biodiversity. So if you think again about those global maps that are derived from studies at very small scales, there's a mismatch between the 32% the loss and the pixel in which it's plotted in. And so these are the things that I obsess about that we struggle with every day. So how do we deal with this? Of course, people have been worried about this for decades. This is nothing new. One of the ways that people deal with it, often not as obvious as this example, is to try to control for area. This is one example from the Hawaiian Islands where these um, colleagues were interested in the effect of island age on biodiversity of plants. Because the Hawaiian Islands are volcanic, this is a five million year old island or six. The, the, the large island um, called Hawaii is a very young island. And they wanted to look at the effect of island age, but they knew there was a big problem because island size changed. And so all they did was they took the y-axis and they divided it and got some interesting patterns. Unfortunately, the problem with that is you're really mixing apples and oranges in a, in a very dramatic way here. If we were to take this island and this place in the, in the Amazon, which has thousands of species per hectare, this island has one species, and divide it by hectares, this island would have more species than this plot in the forest, right? Because we're dividing it by a small number. It's not linear, we can't divide. That's an obvious example, but it turns out that that's what we're often doing. If you dig into the methods, if you dig in the code, if you dig into the supplemental documents, this is how people deal with scale most of the time. What we've shown is that if you do take a different approach, these are the same islands, but we were able to take plot level data with individual abundances of trees, we actually find that the oldest island has more species than the youngest island per unit area and suggests that there's some macroevolutionary process that's influencing local coexistence. So 
most of you probably have heard this story before. Ann Chow has been saying it. Nick Dottelli has been saying it for 20 years. We've been talking about rarefaction for 50 years. So isn't this rarefaction all over again? Yes. There's nothing new that I'm saying. But most of the time when we're trying to do our data analysis, it gets ugly and scary and it's difficult to reconcile and we ignore it. And so we've tried to make it a little easier. We've built some R packages for, for doing some of these rarefactions and for really controlling for sampling extent uh, and it changes in the numbers of individuals versus changes in the relative abundances. And we're adding in a number of features that allow us to deal with things like coverage, which are concepts that Lou Jost and Ann Chow and others have been building. We still need to go further. We need to figure out how to deal with things like body size and life history differences. But I think we're making progress just by emphasizing the importance of this sampling theory. And so I wanna tell you one way we can use the sampling theory in the last few minutes in a paper that we've just recently published where the idea of habitat loss or habitat fragmentation, which um, relates to some of the things that Lenore Farag will talk about in her talk, is that when we start, when humans start influencing the world around us, they're making little islands. And we can use island theory to understand something about how biodiversity changes. Jared Diamond used this theory to really think about how reserves should be designed, leading to things like the Sloss debate. Tom Lovejoy and others built the, the biological dynamics of forest fragmentation experiment in the Amazon to test these ideas explicitly, his idea of ecosystem decay. But the problem is that we're still talking about habitat fragmentation in different ways. What you think about when you talk about habitat fragmentation is very different than what I think about. What Lenore Farag thinks about when she talks about her habitat fragmentation, also including our friend Mark Velland and others, is very different than what um, Robert Fletcher and Nick Haddad and Andy Gonzalez and Bob Holt and others are thinking about when they think about habitat fragmentation. And so they're fighting. They're fighting because they're talking past each other about scale. Lenore Farg, of course, has recognized this, but we don't yet have the data or the ability to analyze the data in the way that allows us to reconcile sort of these patch-based effects of habitat loss to the landscape scale effects. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to dig into this using our R code that I just talked about, but applying it to islands, in this case, habitat islands that are fragments, and in developing this theory, this sort of sampling theory, we're actually testing some of the ideas that go back to Connor and McCoy's classic paper on species area curves, where we can test the idea of things like passive sampling versus area per se or habitat heterogeneity and how those influence biodiversity and how it's lost as habitats get smaller. They were usually talking about how it's gained as habitats get bigger. And so here's one empirical example that I'll start with before I dig into the, the habitat fragmentation. Um, and this is with colleagues in Austria at the border of Austria and Hungary. And Zofia Hor Horvath had gotten a hold of a beautiful data set from more than 60 years ago, where these habitats, these pond habitats were quite frequent in the, in the, in the environment. But over the years, due to agriculture, the ponds were drained, there was a lot of change, and there were fewer and fewer ponds present in this meta community. And what we did was we made a prediction. This red line is the prediction. How many species should be lost as we lose habitat? The blue line is the observation. And so the idea is that because we're predicting we should lose four species just because of habitat alone, only because of geometry, but we lost a lot more than that. That means there's some biology going on. That's all it means. It means there's something about the meta community. There's some dispersal dynamics, colonization and extinction dynamics going on, creating a bigger loss than would have been expected. Of course, we know this kind of a thing happens, but the reason I emphasize this is that most of our models 
for species loss, do this. They just say, what's what we have now, what the species area curve is. So what are we gonna lose if we lose a certain amount of habitat? Okay, those models are based on geometry. They're easy and they're you know, useful, but they don't incorporate the meta community or the effects of these, these, these biological processes. And so one example comes from Feng Lang He and Hubble, where they recognized the importance of this endemics area relationship for understanding how biodiversity would be lost with area. And when you have this endemics area relationship, they suggested with a quite um, aggressive title, overestimate extinction rates from habitat loss. Okay, so the overestimate is because species are aggregated. And so this endemics area curve predicts fewer species to be lost with habitat loss. But the point that I wanna make is that this is still all geometry. It's math of the geometry of how species are distributed in the landscape. And it makes a critical assumption. The critical assumption is if we start out with a patch here, these green and yellow and blue and dots is sort of before habitat loss. And this might be an island fragment after habitat loss. And here's another one and here's another one. We assume the species loss are just gonna be a function of who's left in that box. That's geometry. And it turns out that almost all the models that you see about predictions of habitat loss, species loss with habitat loss, make this assumption. And that assumption means that if I go into that habitat and I count on a per area basis, I put a quadrat down or I put a, a transect in, I should see the same numbers of species in the big patch than the small patch. And the reason why there's species loss is because of course there's more area in the bigger patch, right? So the habitat area effect is very important. The question is, what is the extra piece? And so we wanted to ask what that extra piece was. And it turns out that we couldn't do it with the existing data. If you get habitat fragmentation studies, everybody measures it differently. You might sample proportional to the patch area. So if there's a big patch, you walk a whole lot, count a whole lot of bats or a whole lot of dung beetles or whatever. In a small patch, you just do a little bit. Or you might wanna fix your patch and you sample the same amount here and here. Everybody does it differently. And so it's almost impossible to take the information that are published and make a meta-analysis or inference from the raw information because everybody's methods are different. And so what we realized is we had to get in there and dig into the raw data. And luckily it took about five years, but we got a lot of great colleagues who provided us with the raw data. We got a hold of the appendices. Some colleagues got their hard disks out or their punch cards even in some cases and helped us rebuild the abundance distributions of these species so we could do the analyses more carefully and properly. And with this, what we showed in this paper we just published a few weeks ago was that standardized species richness, not total species richness, but the species richness in a plot was higher in the bigger patches than the smaller patches. I know this doesn't surprise a lot of us, but now we can quantify it because we've controlled for habitat area using these rare faction curves. We can also measure things like evenness. Communities are more even in these bigger patches than in the smaller patches. And then we can start digging into some of the variation because we had a, a lot of data. We had 120 some plots or data sets from different fragments. We were able to look to see if there was any differences. Turns out we couldn't find any obvious differences in taxa. This was a little bit surprising to me, um, but we couldn't find any strong differences in the slopes among taxa. We did find some interesting differences in the slopes geographically. Turns out that Europe has smaller fragmentation effects than South America, North America, and so forth. We think one of the reasons for that is because the fragmentation happened a lot longer ago in Europe. It's still happening or it's quite recent in North and South America. And so you can see this here where the older studies had, the older studies here had smaller fragmentation effects than, than the more recent studies. Of course, this is a little bit 
unusual because we often think that extinction debt means the older studies should have bigger effects. In fact, we're finding the opposite. We also compare the quality of the matrix, comparing things that are very, very harsh like urbanization or, or flooding versus places like shade grown coffee or, or, or less harsh matrices. And we also found that the harshness of the matrix influenced the slope, the, light, the lighter, you know, the and other sort of lighter use systems had, had less of an effect of this ecosystem decay than the harsher filters. And so in the end, one of the reasons why we think we see this, this weaker effect in these older fragments in Europe, for example, isn't because of this, this, um, this uh, extinction debt problem, but there's actually a turnover. It seems that we're getting species in these fragments that are not the same species that live in those larger habitats. And that turnover seems to be stronger in the older fragments and the fragments that have weaker effects. There's, there's more turnover. There's these generalist species, these more tolerant species coming in to the fragments. And so just to wrap up this part, I mentioned already most of our models buried in the methods are based on these ideas of habitat geometry, including ideas that you see in the Convention of Biological Diversity and the IPBS, Ed Wilson's Half Earth, these are all great initiatives, but they're basically making an assumption about how many species should be preserved when we preserve habitat, not thinking about the meta community, not thinking about species interactions and dispersal limitation and all the processes that we love and think about in the context of a meta community. And so, we think we can improve these estimates by adding some of these uh, more biological or ecological processes. So to wrap up, um, biodiversity is a problem. It's a difficult, difficult thing to synthesize. We have to recognize this importance of scale, the sampling issue. And we have to be creative to find ways to get past our biases and to start making comparisons in an apple to apples way. And so the problem is right now, when we, when we synthesize data, we've got our apples and oranges and pears and pineapples all over the world because everybody is sampling things different. We're sampling different kinds of organisms. We're sampling different um, sizes. You know, bacteria are very different than whales. These are huge problems when we're trying to synthesize these response variables. And I hope that we can start making progress by also thinking about the progress from our friends in macroecology and these universal theories and start thinking about ways to combine the two to put these, these, um, these variable scales onto some allometric axes. So with that, I'll conclude with one of my favorite field sites in Hawaii and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. We have some questions for you. Right? When you are ready, we can start. Ready when you are. All right. Let's go. The first one is from Christian Dembrus. Thank you very much, very much for the interesting presentation. It seems counterintuitive to me that dispersion is more important at smaller spatial scale in the paper, in the 2019 paper. At broader scales, you have mountain separate communities, ocean separate continents. How is it possible that in increasing scale, including dispersal barriers, reduce the importance of dispersal from, for our community assembly. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. I think the issue here is that in our, in our uh, toy model, this is a meta community. By definition, uh, you can think about how you wanna think about a meta community, but in our case, we usually think dispersal is possible. Even when there's dispersal limitation, it's not a dispersal barrier. And so I think what the question is referring to is more about cases where there's this 
species pool or the realized species pool is not able to get to certain places. And when, as soon as you do that, you're absolutely 100% correct that the, the ratios of, of niche versus neutral flip again. Absolutely. And it really depends on whether the, the regional pool can get to those habitats and do their business or not. And so the model, the toy model that Duarte did allowed everybody to get everywhere. And I, I suspect that if we added some barriers, we'd get exactly what you're saying. Right. Let me get the next one here. Next one is from Felipe Melo. Fetig argues that fragmentation should be controlled by the amount of habitat, what she calls fragmentation per se. Yep. Do you think this changes the figures of the of your comparisons? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if Lenore has spoken yet or if she speaks later, but clearly um, she'll have lots of good answers to that question as well. So the key thing to remember is we've only gotten a tiny bit of the way towards this synthesis. The analysis that we did was only within patches. So we're still very much coming from the perspective of the Robert Fletcher and the Gonzalez Nekadad view. The Farag view, which we very much want to explore and get to, is a landscape scale effect, which is a meta community effect, right? And so we're still looking at in what's essence alpha diversity in our analyses. And we're saying that alpha diversity is affected by habitat size. Lenore has no problem with that. She absolutely agrees with that. The issue comes with the beta diversity side, which we still don't have a good feeling for because the data are very difficult. We're hoping to get there, but uh, it's a great question. Uh, and again, the issue is again, apples to oranges. Farig's asking questions that are different than we are. And we think we're asking the same thing and we're not. And I think that's the most important thing, lesson that I learn every time I dig into this is that we all have a different perspective on what it is we're asking. And, and because we're using words that don't accept all of that nuance, sometimes we, we, we lose this. And so I think it's critical to make people, that's why I always make my students and postdocs go back to first principles. Every manuscript, every paper, every talk, go to first principles because then we know your assumptions. We know your worldview and then build it from there. And then we have a more, we can have that conversation in a more you know, appropriate way. Right, wonderful. I have more questions here. They are coming. <laughs> this one is unidentified. Let me get the next one as they put the name on it. Sebast Sebastian Felipe, thank you very much for your presentation. Do you think that the scale problems are pointing out means that we have looked back to reanalyze many of the previous generations about diverse patterns, community structures, or even traffic, inter uh, even traffic interactions? Sorry, do you, did you get? Yeah, I, the last part. Yes, again. Yeah, I, I think I got the first part. The last part was just trophic interactions, yeah? Yeah, so yes. basically the question so, is, you know, I, I hate to be cynical, though I, am, I obviously am. I, I do believe that a lot of our previous meta-analyses, let's call it um, 1.0, were very useful, but I don't think we've solved the problems. Productivity, diversity, latitudinal gradients. My, my group and I are working on these old, old questions because we think there's value to digging in a little bit deeper to ask not just how species richness changes because of all this ugly scale dependence, but to ask how rarefied species richness changes, numbers of individuals, the spatial structuring changes, and we think we can get more insight. Unfortunately, the data are very challenging to get. Um, even when people collected it, they often throw it away 
And so um, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is trying to rescue data. Uh, every one of my PhD students and postdocs usually develop a, a project where they rescue data for a particular problem by helping, you know, contacting authors, getting the raw information, not just the, the, the summary information, because the summary information is what people usually put in their appendices, and that's not enough. And so we're hoping to build on that. Right. Now the last question I was trying to do, to make, is from Sistemas Complexos, the UNGS. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. I wonder if the history of fragmentation of a site could have an influence. I don't know if there is enough data for analysis. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the, you know, the history, there's the history like time, but there's also history like what, um, you know, what were the reasons they did the fragmentation in the first place? What are the sort of constraints on, on land use? Um, so absolutely, it can have a huge effect. At the moment, our data set is still very much based on the methods of the, the literature search. And so we would have to get sort of underlying layers of, of you know, that information from Chelsea or hopefully better kinds of, um, you know, spatial data sets. At the moment, it's difficult. Right. Thank you. Let me get the next one. It's from Mariana Lars. Thank you for the great conference. How to deal not only with the scale problem to achieve the synthesis, but with the enormous diversity of types of systems? Yeah. Um, help. <laughs> I, it's, it's a question that I don't have a good answer to. I, I feel like we're working towards it. You know, if we can compare if we can find features that are similar, like we're trying to compare marine biological change, I guess Maria probably talked about some of our results from marine versus terrestrial systems. That's cool, but are those real differences or are those differences because the marine organisms are smaller than the terrestrial organisms or they have faster turnover time? Um, I, 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 Clearly, I'm interested in this and we're working towards solutions, but I also like to recognize that our solutions are only partial. And so, you know, I, I hope that some of the, if we can create an allometric perspective, like body size plays a big role, obviously, um, life history, um, you know, those kinds of things help getting at some of these syntheses, um, you know, t turnover rates. Um, so we can compare like to like in a marine system versus a terrestrial system. Plankton and trees are very different. So yeah, lots to do. Nice. The next question is from Valerio Pilar. Isn't the scale effect on the importance of the environment versus dispersal related to the green size of the environmental factor varying variation being considered? Um, I know Valerio has considered it. Um, I, I, rec I, I think that when people do synthesis, they, they will put things in um, categories sometimes. And so they'll say, you know, there's a category of X extent. Usually it'll be kilometers or something like that. But one of the problems is that the scaling effect is, as we were just saying, it's relative to the organism. A kilometer means something very different to trees than it does to algae. And so um, just like I was telling you, you know, the BCI forest plot is the same size as my meta community in ponds. But I, 250,000 trees in BCI versus several million in the ponds are just, they're just, not the same thing. And so people have been recognizing and dealing with scale, no question, Valerio, but I don't think 
I, I still think we're trading it flat as a, a simple covariate. And I think we need to be slightly more creative to deal with that. Nice, thank you very much. Next question is from Brian J. Enquist. Enjoy our talk, John. A key driver in differences in number of individuals, biomass, and cetras, and turnover in his body size. Shouldn't we be assessing the and standardizing for size differences? Sorry, I missed the last part. If you, if you need me to repeat any question. Yeah, the, the last sentence, please. Free. Right. Shouldn't we be assessing and is standardizing for size differences? Yes, Brian. Obviously, you're the man who, uh, this is Brian Anquist, who is one of the disciples of Jim Brown and his group. Um, clearly, that I think that's the next phase for me. Um, it's where my own abilities are limited, but I do think if we can find these allometric uh, relationships and use that as a way to make apples to apples comparisons that will be quite useful, which is what I'm vaguely trying to get at at the end is the next step is to take all these big data bioinformatic syntheses and emerge it with this other, ver this other community who've been trying to achieve generality, which is Brian Anquist and Jim Brown and David Storch and all of these people who've been trying to create more allometric perspectives. Um, so yes, we need to deal with body size, no question. Next one is from Magdon Daniel. Thanks for the excellent talk. Is abject fragmentation good for biodiversity or not? I think that's Lenore Farig. She talks tomorrow or today later. I think that is a better question for her. Um, in my in my worldview, biodiversity isn't the right measure. Right. And I think part of the problem, I love biodiversity as a question, but we often have in our minds good biodiversity and then all that other crap, these invasive species, these other things, these, you know, and so oftentimes you'll even see and like predicts, they talk about the biodiversity intact index and it's 100% in the native forest and it can only go down. Right. And so when you say good for biodiversity, it very much depends on how you measure biodiversity. Are you talking about all species? Are you talking about alpha diversity? Are you talking about beta or gamma diversity? Um, you know, is it all taxa or only the native forest taxa that you're interested in? Um, in the end, yes, we can create a meta community theory and analysis that would answer that question. And the answer will uncertainly be. You know, it's going to depend on the, the ratio of species that like the forest and the ratio of species that like the matrix, right? And if that matrix is a cornfield that gets pesticide all the time and it's really awful, probably it's bad. But if that matrix is sort of an old growth or a cattle field or, you know, something where there's lots of invasive species, but also lots of native species that like the open forest, probably going to get more species. Right? We often find because beta diversity is going up, we often see more species. So I'm not sure that's the right question. Wonderful. The next question is from Rafaela Granzotti. Thanks for the amazing talk, Dr. Chase. Do you think that diversity of statistical methods that we have in community ecology? also contributes to it depends issues? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, I think what I was alluding to earlier is that it's critical that we get our definitions straight. Now, I, I, I'm not one to make definitions like literal, like what's a niche? Is it this or this? But we have to start from the same perspective in order to find this generality, just like I was saying, you know, the effect of invasive species on native species diversity depends on scale, it depends on um, where you are in the world, it depends on what kinds of species you're measuring. Um, 
but those are all context dependent things. Um, and it, the answer would probably, you know, it, it depends, yes, but we can actually achieve some understanding and, and move forward if we're all talking about apples and apples. The problem is that we're still talking about apples and oranges, but we think we're not. Next question is from Pamela Freeman. Thank you very much for your talk. Regarding the studies of habitat loss, it's common to, in the discussion to consider only species loss and extinction. Do you think we need to try to include more discussions about habitats and functional loss of species? Yeah, for sure. This is a great question. I mean, uh, certainly abundance uh, comes into all of the the math, all of the metrics that we've developed, but functional and phylogenetic information is not yet. And, and what we've been working on, of course, a lot of people are thinking very deeply about, about that. And again, that's, um, it's really important. I think it's really useful when we compare changes in taxonomic diversity to changes in functional or phylogenetic diversity, because then that allows us to answer hypotheses that we're not able to answer just by looking at changes in one of them. And so no question we need to incorporate, do a better job for some questions of incorporating information on functional traits or phylogeny, if that's what you're interested in. Um, at the moment, I've, I've kept to taxonomic diversity because that's where we've often built these hypotheses. But as we continue to move down this path, we absolutely have to incorporate what we're advocating is multiple versions of diversity, alpha, beta, gamma, rarefied, not rarefied at the taxonomic scale, but also at the functional and the phylogenetic scale, and then you'll have a much better answer. Sorry, you muted. Yeah. <laughs> I was muted. Uh, right. Next question is from Pedro Bassa. Thank you very much for your talk. My question is, is it correct to assume that scale, sorry, we are in anything. Is it correct to assume that scale will never be 100% solved problem? Yes, unfortunately. Um, one of the things, you know, again, I, I find it exciting. One also might find it frustrating that the answer is always leading to more questions. And so scale is certainly useful. When you combine scale with allometry, it's even better. When you combine it with functional and phylogenetic, it's even better. But you know, it's it's still we're we're, we're imperfect. We're imperfect organisms looking at a very complex world and trying to um, trying to make inference about a very complex thing in a in a, in a few dimensions. It's a very high dimensional system that we're looking at in a few dimensions. And so we're never going to get all the way to the answer, but I do, f I find it exciting to get closer to the answer, but no, no question. Um, scale doesn't solve everything. There's certainly a lot of other variation out there. Wonderful. The next question is from Leonardo Saravia. So, habitat scale is very important, and the scale of individuals' size is very important. Do you think that you can join these two theories? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think this is related to some of the answers that I gave to Brian Enquist and, and earlier. Um, absolutely, I think body size is a critical um, feature that we, I haven't done a good job at including yet. Um, because rarefaction just says N, numbers of individuals. Um, but especially when you have those in, in the same sample, rarefying a blue whale together with a, a you know, plankton is, is crazy. You're getting very different things. And so you're going to, it's going to influence your answer. Um, there's lots of, you know, and people, that sounds ridiculous, but that's actually what people do when they're looking at microbes when they're doing metabarcoding for microbes and, and eukaryotes in the soil for example you know they're looking at giant worms and nematodes and comparing that to tiny tiny little things 
Um, and so we absolutely need to think about body size in a more um, deliberate way. And I, I do think our, our friends and colleagues in the macro uh, world ha have already started to achieve some of those answers. And, and I, I hope that we can combine them. Right. The next question is from Jacqueline Zeni. How was a scientist that usually sample in a narrow scale because the limited human and financial resources can contribute to create a more robust scenario to answer the synthesis questions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is how do we design monitoring programs that are doable, right? Because the, the data that we're saying we need is individual level data. Anybody who's collected these data are like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. We can't do that. You know, you're going to sit in the mud and count a million dragonflies or you're going to, you know, count a million trees or, or, or whatever. That's just, you know, that's why we didn't have, you know, it's just very difficult to do. So there's two ways. One is um, it, it turns out that there's some nice allometries between presence absence and abundance. And so if we can look at start looking at occupancy relationships, we might be able to make progress without measuring every individual. I still prefer having every individual. And if you do that, we can come up with, but we, we've created this little virtual simulator. I showed some um, pictures. It's just colored dots on a map. And by doing those colored dots on a map, you know, we have a little, um, our program and a little on CRAN and a little shiny. Um, and we're hoping to roll out this in, in the context of a book where people can actually move those little dots around and come up with the right sampling regime where you can capture the information in this big patch from small information. And, you know, there are some recommendations. The recommendations involve where you put the plots and how you sample with those plots to get at sort of average alphas and betas and gammas in that way without killing yourself. So it is doable, um, but, but the, you know, one, I think one of the bigger issues that we come up with is that everybody comes up with their own favorite uh, sampling regime. And so what we really need to think about is standardization um, when sampling. We all know the arbitrary choices that we make um, when out there counting stuff and, and thinking about how to make that more standardized would be really useful. All right. The next question is from André Padial. Professor Chase, what a great speech. Thank you a lot. Community ecology usually have as a primary implication for biodiversity conservation. Do you think it's silly to try to find the most suit suitable scale, no matter what you mention for conservation studies? studies? Oh, that's outside of my expertise for sure. I've um, purposefully avoided conservation in a, like, a way that matters. I like to, you know, think about this in an intellectual way. And I know that's unfair because, you know, we should be thinking about how to make the world a better place. And, you know, is there the right scale? I still don't think that's the right question. Of course, it depends on if you're, if you're, you know, a manager of a national park, your scale is something very different than if you're worried about biodiversity of the entire country. Um, but I hope that we can find a way to think about these, again, to think about biodiversity in a scaling way. Now, conservation, though, I would point out, oftentimes we equate biodiversity with conservation. And I also think that there's some danger there because what we really mean is we want to preserve some important species, you know, and we've created biodiversity as a catch-all for important species. But that's where the danger comes in when you start looking at the results from Mark Velland and others is that numbers of species isn't necessarily what we want all the time, right? Because there's more species outside my window 
right here in the middle of the city center of, of Leipzig than there are in the beautiful floodplain forest, right? But biodiversity isn't necessarily the thing we should be conserving. We should think more about types of species and, and maybe we need to think a little bit more about what conservation should be. All right. The next question is from Elvira de Bastiani. Sorry if I mispronounced it. Hello, Professor Chase. Thank you very much for your presentation. Professor, when we think about parasitic host interaction, we have a set of mechanisms that contribute to structure of parasitic metacommunity can be highly complex. Since host metacommunities can exhibit complex response to local and spatial process with host responses to large scales environmental variation and parasite response to variation in host characteristics, all contributing to the dynamics of parasitic metacommunity. This is all. I didn't get it. So I'm sorry, I don't quite see the question. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that um, was absent for most of my talk is species interactions. And, and, and I think that's a huge limitation. And so in parasitic meta communities or, or food webs or pollination networks or seed dispersal networks, species interactions can play a strong role. And we, we kind of, you know, it, the results are the results, regardless of whether we consider them or not, but it really does sometimes make a, a big difference if you consider, especially in parasitic meta communities where these things are really heavily reliant on each other. Um, so the dynamics can really shift a little bit. All right. Next one is from Alexander Holden. Hi, thank you. Thanks to Jonathan by the talk. I have a question. How difficult should be to define if the global biodiversity as much taxa is decreasing since we know that the declining or increasing depends more of the species or taxa? As your examples, invertebrate and plants could have increased and vertebrate have lost. Sorry, can you repeat the first part? How difficult can it be to define if the global biodiversity as much taxa is decreasing since we have that the declining or increasing depend more of the species or taxes? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is an issue of global diversity is always declining, right? Unless we want to start invoking speciation like Chris Thomas likes to talk about. Um, we usually think global diversity like at the planet scale is declining, but anything less than the planet whether they increase or decrease is going to depend on the ratios of, of winning and losing. Uh, meaning, are, is your range size or your abundance increasing or decreasing? And that very much depends on the drivers. If it's an anthropogenic driver, is that driver, you know, is it benefiting or, or, or hurting that species? And I, there's always winners and losers in every taxa. Some taxa, amphibians, tend to lose more. Others, cockroaches maybe, maybe tend to win more. But um, I think that's a hard question to answer without sort of no 